Hello everyone, this is John from Coins, RPGs, and more. And in today's video, I am going to uh, do a, a video on how to create a character using the Cypher System role-playing game by Monty Cook Games. I previously filmed a video, some of you may have seen it, um, where I did this same process and I went through and I created a, a different character. Unfortunately, there were some errors in that video. Uh, the most notably the error that I, my shirt was inside out and I didn't find out about that until later because I'm a bit of a dunce sometimes. And so I took it, I, I've unlisted it. Um, I didn't get rid of it completely because as much as I was personally embarrassed, it might still be funny in the future. So it's, it's still out there uh, if anyone has the link. That, <laughs> anyway, um... So to correct that mistake and uh, make sure that yeah we're we're good we're good today, I decided to go ahead and redo it. I'd planning on I'd been planning on doing a second character creation video anyway, so it's not like I was going too far out of my way. So that's enough of, of gilding the lily, so to speak. Let's get into the nitty gritty. Now, what you need to create a cipher system character sheet. First, you need a character sheet. Uh, I have created one in my notebook and I made this character sheet based upon the one that is in the back of the cypher system core rulebook you can uh, just take the one from the back of the core of the core rulebook maybe photocopy that page there are character sheets you can print off online uh, there's a lot of different stuff available so don't feel like you have to do what I did I do I like creating my own sheets simply because I can keep them all in this great notebook where I am storing all the information for all the different games and characters that I make specifically for this channel so that I can find them again later. But that's my personal decision. You don't have to do that. Uh, the, um, the anatomy of a Cypher System character sheet is pretty straightforward. But I'll use the previously created character as a demonstration. Uh, Gripthon. So first you have your character's sentence. So Gripthon is a strong warrior who masters the sword, or masters weaponry being the official term, or foci. So this is your name, your character's descriptor, strong, your character's type, warrior and your character's foci master's weaponry or master's of the sword though that one sentence is going to dictate the rest of what your character does uh, the other thing you're going to have is you're going to have your your tier uh, all characters start as tier one there are seven tiers available you can kind of think of it like uh, seven levels but in the cipher system a tier is equivalent to in D, &D terms like three levels uh, a tier one character, in my opinion, is kind of like a, a third level character in the D&D &D game. So if you if you are one of those people that says, I never want to start at first level in Cypher System, you can start at first tier. You'll be fine. Um, effort. That's the number of times that your character can apply effort to a single roll. It starts off at one and uh, then goes up every tier it it gets uh, higher and higher so by tier when you reach tier seven you can apply seven levels of effort which means you can use your spend your points to make it easier to accomplish a goal seven times per turn that is important to remember because that's how you're going to be able to modify things now look at this cute one she decided she really wanted to be in the video and was climbing my leg to prove a point isn't she adorable? We love her. Look at that tail. All right. Anyway, back to the character sheet. Uh, you have three main, uh, three dice pools or three ability scores. I kind of, I, I refer to those ability scores, but they're really, uh, they're just your dice pools. You have might, speed, and intellect. Might, speed, and intellect uh, function both as the pools of points that power your abilities as well as your hit points so it's kind of a a very careful balancing act 
of when do I spend points to power my abilities and when do I conserve those points because I need them to be able to absorb damage or, or uh, in combat. You also have each one has an edge. The edge is how many points they can uh, or how, how many points they can apply for free. So if having an edge of one means that you don't actually pay for the first point spent every time you want to uh, use an ability. So if you have an ability a special ability for your character that costs one might point and you have a might edge of one, you can use that ability for free uh, every, pretty much every action, every, every turn. Uh, anything else you do, you pay full price for, but that first one is free. Uh, from there, there's the, the recovery dice, which is usually a D6 plus whatever modifiers you happen to get as you uh, go up tiers. And then you, there are three or four different times you can roll your recovery dice. You can do recovery as an action, so you spend your turn recovering. You can do recovery as a 10-minute uh, recovery, so your character spends 10 minutes doing a rest. There's a one-hour rest, kind of like stopping for a lunch break uh, in the middle of adventuring. And then there's the 10-hour, which is basically this is when you're, you're off shift. This is when you're back at the inn, you're sleeping for probably assumed to six to eight hours of that time, and the rest of the time is spent eating, drinking, maybe planning, and generally relaxing and recovering, maybe caring for your equipment, uh, could be other things that you're doing during that time. But it's rest time, it's not time spent adventuring, and when you finish that, you get to make your d6 plus whatever modifier roll to recover your ability points. Um, there are two... Uh, parts of the damage, uh, two classifications for damage. So if you've taken, if you lose all of the points in, say, your might or any one of your pools, but let's let's say might for this one, you lose all those might points, your character becomes impaired. And if they lose all the points in a second one of the three ability pools, then they become uh, debilitated. Impaired simply means that they, basically everything that they do uh, is one one asset worse. Uh, or if you're using the mod, if you're using modifiers, you can say it's basically get a minus three modifier to all your rolls. If you are uh, debilitated, it's a minus six modifier to all your rolls, and it, everything costs uh, more points uh, in order to activate it. So not only are you paying uh, more of your ability points to activate special abilities, but anytime you you try to use those abilities, you also are going to be at a minus six to your rolls on top of whatever you've paid for them. So it, acting becomes very, very expensive. Uh, doing anything aside from a standard action it becomes very expensive very fast. The other thing that character helps you keep track of is your advancement towards the next tier. And that's tracked here. There are four... Five, sorry, five different ways you can advance. Now, you only need to use four of those. Uh, typically, you want to increase the die pools or the pools that you have for your points. Spending four experience points allows you to increase that by four. Uh, you can buy an, a plus one edge to one of your uh, pools. That also costs four experience points. You can buy plus one to the effort for your character. That costs four experience points. You can gain a new skill uh, and that costs four experience points or you can do other things now there's a lot of stuff listed under other but the one that i recommend the most is you can spend four experience points to get a plus two bonus to your recovery rolls and you can do that once per tier that's uh, pretty awesome, especially I, I tend to run combat focused characters um, when I've played and When you get into a fight your pools go down really really fast So anything that can help you get back up on your feet is a great thing to do And, and you basically do that instead of taking another skill and if you're already got all the skills you want your character to have That's fine. So then we list we have a list of the skills that our character has and next to each of the skills is going to be um, there's a, there can be things that you're just skilled at and you know how to do. Those are then there's things that you're trained at. You get a plus three modifier or an asset anytime you use those those skills. 
those are the ones that I really tend to write down because they're they're important. It's important to know which ones you're are you trained at. Basically, anything anything else you can attempt. Um, and then if you are specialized in the skill, you'd put an S next to it, and then you get a plus uh, six to that roll automatically, or two assets automatically, whenever you use that ability. So that's something else to keep track of. Uh, then you've got your abilities. You want to mark down the different abilities that your character uses and has, as well as what they mean. Now, I did some very basic description of what these things do in this character sheet. If you're doing one uh, on a computer where you can type things out, I recommend actually using the PDF to uh, co either copy and paste elements from the abilities into your character sheet so you have all the rules, or manually typing it out for yourself, typing out just the important in information so you have that information at your fingertips because you might not remember and your DM might not remember either. So it's good to just have your ducks in a row, so to speak. Uh, then there's the attacks. You want to keep track of the different kind of attacks your character can do and how much damage those can potentially do as well. And if you have bonuses or modifiers to those attack rolls, then uh, it's a good idea to keep those here next to the weapon that would get that bonus as well. Ciphers. You want to list how many... Uh, this is the part where you, you would list how many ciphers your character can use at or carry at any given time. Anything beyond that number and the ciphers won't interact well with each other and you basically, uh, um, in the game, they just don't work, is what the rule says. And there's your DM can, your, your game master can kind of modify that a little bit and say there's a chance that one of them might explode if you keep hold on to them for too much longer. They really want to encourage people to only carry the, the two that they start with in the case of this character or... Um, some characters can, can bear more. And as you get higher in tiers, you can bear more ciphers. That's something that does scale up with your character, but in the beginning, it's usually two. And then lastly, you want to keep track of your equipment. I, I keep this slot pretty small because most of the equipment is either going to be accounted for in other sections of the character sheet, or uh, you're not really carry, carrying that much. So that's the basic anatomy of, of a cipher system character sheet. So we've got our blank character sheet here. And now we're going to create a character. Now I've already mapped this character out just like I did with the previous one in the previous video. And so all I'm going to do is I'm going to fill in what I've already decided I'm going to do. I do that because otherwise uh, if I did it, if I created this character the same way I did for Swords and Wizardry Continual Light where I hadn't decided on before it started, we'd be here for a while. And I don't want to do that to you. We, this video has already gotten long enough with that explanation of the character sheet. So let's just get right to it. Uh, so the next thing you need to create a character is you need a pencil to fill in your character sheet. Always fill in character sheets with pencil. Why? Because you change things. And erasers are awesome. They are your friend. Um, you want to use erasable pen. That's, that's fine too. I personally prefer pencil. I'm a traditionalist in that sense. Uh, but then you need the, the book. You can use either this book, which is the current edition, or the previous uh, first edition Cypher System rulebook. Both are great. Both have basically the same stuff in them. The second edition is a bit more comprehensive and includes a lot more. So, and it has a lot more suggestions on how to modify and special and uh, modify things and flavor things and and add a whole bunch of stuff to it to make it so that your character is truly unique. The options in this book are absolutely staggering. That's why it's my preferred one, but uh, we're gonna stick pretty basic for today. We're gonna start with our character's type. And the character that I'm gonna create, I want to, the first character I made is a warrior. So I wanna make someone who's going to be kind of a, more of a support character for that warrior, someone who is uh, out there to both be a helping hand and also um, maybe out for themselves a little bit too. And I've decided that I'm going to make the uh, cipher system equivalent of sort of a bard kind of person. Uh, and so that means that they're going to be a speaker in cipher system paraloids, that the speaker is the type. So I'm going to write that down on my sheet. All 
All right. So they're a speaker. Now, I also need their descriptor. So I'm going to skip ahead a little bit to get the descriptor. And the descriptor I chose is appealing. This is going to be an appealing speaker. The uh, It's important that they're an appealing speaker because, well, if they're a bard uh, kind of person, if they're a storyteller, then they need to be appealing to their audience, right? Uh, so I think that's that part is important. But I also like it because... A, Someone who is appealing as a descriptor means they're a bit more appealing than the average. So we're going to go with this. So appealing. Okay, it's an appealing speaker. And let's just go with that for right now. Uh, so they're going to start out with a might of eight, a speed of nine, and an intellect of 11 as a speaker. So we're going to fill those in real quick. Eight, nine, and eleven. Okay. They get six additional points to spend. I'm going to put those six points into intellect, bringing us to 17 for intellect. All right. And then let's go to the... Uh, the descriptor because that usually modifies your diet your pools now let's see what that does so a speaker get a appealing character gains a plus two to their intellect pool because they're charismatic so that 17 now becomes a 19 they also gain the skill pleasant social interactions And they're trained in that one. So we're going to put a T next to it to symbolize trained. Uh, beyond there, uh, see, they are resistant to charm. So resistant to charm is a special ability. You are aware of how others can manipulate and charm people. And you notice when those tactics are used on you. Because of this awareness, you are trained in resisting any type of persuasion or seduction if you wish it. So, we're going to write resisting, persuasion, resisting, seduction, trained. And put a T next to that. Okay. And then, uh, lastly, it's links to, suggested links to the starting adventure. Now, the link that this character is going to have to the starting adventure is that uh, they are going to follow. They're choosing to uh, follow the warrior because they see the warrior as someone who's just starting out, whose ability has the ability to become a great hero and they decided that they want to be this person's sort of uh, hype uh, hype person. They're going to try to hype them up and make them even more popular, make them even more powerful because they feel that if they can make this this warrior even more powerful and popular and uh, and get them and so that they get a lot of attention from those people who can hire them for great jobs, then this character will also reap the benefits of those things and be able to become more powerful and more popular. Excuse me. Anyway, so that's gonna that that does that. That's the descriptor. So let's go back to the type, and we're gonna finish that out. Now the effort is one, of course. We already did, done that. They have an intellect edge of one and a might and speed edge of zero. So we're just gonna write one under or next to intellect edge and we'll leave the other two blank. Next, 
they can bear two ciphers at a time. So next to ciphers, we write a two. That's pretty common. Most, most characters start out with two ciphers at a time. I think the adept can get three, um, but that's an exception. All right. Now, weapon use. They are skilled, or they can use light weapons without penalty, but they have an inability with medium and heavy weapons. And attacks with medium and heavy weapons are hindered. So now inability and hindered are synonyms for the same thing. Basically, it's a it's a one one step. Every action you take with that weapon is one step harder. I am taking this to assume that uh, they're only uh, doing one step harder in this case. So the uh, character would basically be at minus three to attack with any. Uh, medium or heavy weapon. So they're a light weapon only person. I don't I don't really think we need to write that down. I think we just remember that. If, if you're completely new, then you would write that down just to remind yourself. Starting equipment, appropriate clothing, and a light weapon of your choice. Okay, so a light weapon. I'll just write that down under equipment light weapon. Okay. Two expensive items, two moderate items, and four inexpensive. So two expensive. Two moderate and four inexpensive. Okay. That's gonna as well that'll be what we get for our starting gear. And then we have the abilities that we get as our starting character, we can pick uh, four of the abilities. Now, for this type, the abilities are as follows. Anecdote, babble, demeanor of command, encouragement, enthrall, erase memories, fast talk, inspire aggression, interaction skills, practiced with medium weapons, spin identity, terrifying presence, and understanding. Now this character is much more of a, a supportive character. They're, they're not a combat machine. They're not designed for that, and they know that about themselves. So practice with medium weapons kind of is out, is just, we're going to leave that out. But let's look at the other ones that we want to select. So I think Encouragement and enthrall are two important ones. So let's write those down. And then we're going to go with under, understanding and interaction skills for the other two. All right. So before we get to the abilities, we also need to go to our foci. This is the part that um, is really important. So now well, there's two paths that we could take. There, there are two foci that are kind of neat and appropriate to this. One of this works miracles. If you want to be more of a, a clerical type, uh, you want to be someone who actually does healing magic, then you pick Works Miracles because that foci gives you the ability to kind of uh, the cypher system equivalent of the curing cure wounds spell. You get that, and there's other abilities you get along the way as well. Another one you can do is uh, someone who helps their friends. Um, helps their friends gives you the special special abilities to be a very helpful person, basically. 
I'm going to go with Works Miracles because I like the ability, I like the idea of the bard who also can kind of heal. Maybe they're a holy bard. Maybe they, they're a storyteller that's attached to a order of, of knights. And that's how they met this person. This person has the potential of being a great knight. And, uh, but they need, they're, maybe they're very unpersonable. They don't have a strong personality. And so this, maybe this person was assigned to them. Maybe they weren't inspired by them. Maybe they simply were assigned to them and say, you will make this person better. Ah, uh, you know, it could, that could be. So anyway, works miracles is the foci we're going to go with. Oop. And the, the ability that that gives us at tier one is healing touch. So I'm going to write healing touch down. And works miracles. Okay, now we need to decide. Now we need to find out what all these things do, so that we can write it down on our sheet. So we go from there to our abilities, and encouragement is it costs one intellect point. So we're going to write down one I. to activate. And what that does is, while you maintain this ability through ongoing inspiring oration, your allies within short range ease one of their the following task types of your choice as the player, uh, defense tasks, attack tasks, or tasks related to any skill that you are trained or specialized in. So, most commonly, you would probably be using this to either aid your ease your allies' attacks or defense roles. Because in a combat situation, those are the ones that are going to uh, make the most difference. And what that means essentially is uh, you, you make each task one step easier. If you're using the step system, then that just basically means that the difficulty is one step lower for both of the attacks or the, or the defense roles. If you are using, if you want, if you need a modifier uh, number to make that make sense to you, then that that's a plus three or a minus three. So uh, they would either get a plus three to their roll for either the attack or the defense, or you could say that's a minus three to the target number. Uh, either one, either method works more or less. So, but it, but it has to be ongoing oration. So let's say ongoing oration, uh, one ease. Attack, defense, other. Attack and defense. Okay. Um, so next is the ability enthrall. Let's see, where is Enthrall? I know it's here. I think it's probably the next page. There we go. Enthrall, one intellect point. All right, enthrall. While talking, you grab and keep another creature's attention, even if the creature can't understand you. For as long as you do nothing but speak, you can't even move. The other creature takes no actions other than to defend itself, even over multiple rounds. If the creature is attacked, the effect ends. So. This is an ability that I find absolutely amusing because this is the ability that every great villain has. 
You want uh, to know how your villains can get away with monologuing? Use the enthrall ability on your players. They must be enthralled with what your villain is talking about. And you get to monologue all you want. And they can't stop you. <laughs> That's built into the rules. I love it. Anyway, or your characters have now have the ability to enthrall the villain and monologue at the villain, explaining all the different ways they have have thwarted or are going to thwart their plans. I find the enthrall ability hilarious, highly useful and hilarious. So uh, that, that's why I included it on this list. So um, I, you know what? It's too much to just write down. Basically, they can't do anything except defend themselves while you're talking. Uh, I, mean, I don't even know how to write all that down on this sheet, so I'm just going to uh, mark down to page number 136. All right. From there, we're going to go to the next one, which is... Healing Touch. One Intellect Point. With a touch, you restore d6 points to one stat pool of any creature. This ability is a difficulty to intellect task. Each time you attempt to heal the same creature, the task is hindered by an additional step. The difficulty returns to two after that creature rests per 10 hours. Notice that that's after the creature rests, not after your character rests. That's an interesting point and one to keep in mind uh, for prospective storytellers out there. All right. So D6 points to one stat pool. Healing touch, D6. And it costs uh, one intellect. to activate that one. And it takes an action, so you're doing this instead of attacking or uh, doing something else on the battlefield. And it is difficulty two, intellect task. So here's the interesting thing about that. Uh, difficulty two, what that means is the target number is six. So it, you roll a 20-sided die, and as long as you roll a six or higher, you succeed in this test. So it's a relatively easy task. There's a high chance that you'll succeed, but you can make it even better. If you have the ability to just make it one step better, then suddenly the difficulty is a three. You lower the difficulty by one, it, the target number becomes a three. Now you just have to roll a three or higher. It's a, it's a, it's a cool ability, and if you are in a, in a desperate situation, I can see people doing that. But it does. It would cost you some intellect points to do that, in addition to the one point that you've spent in order to activate the ability. So it's it's a it's a trade off, and you don't, you're not only guaranteed one six-sided dice were the points to be healed to your target. So, you know, think about it. Anyway, next, moving to the next one. Is information skills. Interaction skills, sorry. You are trained in two skills in which you are not already trained. Cool. Choose two of the following. Deceiving, persuading, public speaking, seeing through deception, or intimidation. So let's do persuading and public speaking. And they're both 
trains. I'm going to put a T next to both of them. Okay. And then we go to the last one, which is understanding. Understanding costs one intellect point to activate. So let's write that down. One intellect. Understanding. You observe or study a creature or object. Your next interaction with that creature or object gains one asset, action. So that could mean, it's just your next interaction. I translate that to mean that you've spent time, let's say you're at a party, your character's at a party and they're analyzing the people around them and, they, and you see a particularly noble person that you're like, I want, to, I want to be able to get on this person's good side. Like I've got to, get on the good side of the evil count so that I can persuade them to give me, um, or I can find out from them the information that I need in order to be able to raid their mansion later to steal away their prisoner. Um, you spend that round trying to observe the count or, or learn about the count through observation and through gaining understanding of them and then when you go in to make your persuasion role later to try to persuade the count to uh, talk to you and inter interact with you, your that next role is going to be one step easier, giving yourself a automatic plus three modifier if you think about it that way. So that's pretty cool. Um, observe or study a creature or object. You gain one asset. Also, if you're trying to analyze, say, a, a cipher item to find out what it does, then that also pertains to that one. You, you use your knowledge, your esoteric knowledge, in order to be, gain a greater understanding of that item. So it's a pretty useful ability for a support type character. Anyway, let's go on to uh, equipment. Now, we know that they're going to have a light weapon. So let's look at light weapons. A light weapon would be like a knife or a wooden club, a blowgun, a dagger, a hand axe. We're going to give this person a dagger because I think everyone in a game, especially a medieval fantasy game, should carry a dagger. They're just useful. You always need a knife to cut something, even if it's just your food. So, dagger. A dagger's a light weapon, so it deals for, uh, sorry, deals two damage. So you're just gonna write a two next to the dagger to remind us. All right, and then we get uh, two moderately price, oh, sorry, two expensive items. And I'm going to look at the expensive items. Now, expensive items could be a battle axe, a bow, a cutlass, a light crossbow, a quarterstaff, a sword, okay, a breastplate, a brigandine, chainmail armor, a bag of heavy tools, or a bag of light tools. Those are examples of expensive items. I'm... I'm going to say that one of their expensive items is going to be fine clothing. Their clothing is, immac is, is really nice. It's, it's immaculate. It's well designed. So that's one of their expensive items is fine clothing. The other one. I'm going to give them a an instrument, a nice instrument, because this is a bard type character, and so they're going to have a a fine lute. Okay, now we have two moderately priced items to go go over and purchase. Moderately priced items. 
Uh, blowgun, dagger, hand axe, a substandard sword or a throwing knife. Hides and furs or a leather jerkin as armor. Or they could get a backpack, a bedroll, a crowbar, an hourglass, a lantern, a rope, a signal horn, a spikes and a hammer, or a tent. I'm thinking that this person is going to start out with a backpack and a bedroll. Okay, and now you get four inexpensive items to pick. The inexpensive items are uh, 10 arrows, uh, 10, uh, sorry, 12 arrows, 12 crossbow bolts, a rusty and worn knife, a wooden club, a burlap sack, a candle, one day worth of rations, or three torches. Uh, we're going to pick, you know, three days worth of rations and three torches. And that's it. That's a finished character. We, the only thing we haven't done is selected uh, ciphers for that character, but that's something that I want to do with the cipher, uh, the deck of cards that I have. And um, I'll do that when it comes time to run this character through a game. So all told, this is that character sheet all finished up. Excuse me. The only thing that we haven't done, actually the only thing that I'm going to do now is we need to give this character a name. This character needs a name. Uh, some way to recognize them. And let's say... Tamilla. Right. Okay, Tamilla. T-O-M-I-L-L-A. Tamilla. Okay, so we have Gripthron, Gripthon and Tamilla as two fully created Cypher System characters. At some point in the future, I intend to, to uh, take these two characters and run them through a very basic scenario. Or I'll take one of them and run them through a very basic scenario so you can see how the Cypher System plays. That is how we make, make a character from start to finish. And thank you for coming with me on this journey. I hope you all have a wonderful day. Peace be with you. Bye-bye.